Hello friends and welcome to our next installment of Psalms in Pursuit of Praise. Appreciate your coming here to spend some time studying God's Word together and uh, we're going to get started on page 8 of your handouts. This is chapter 4 covering Psalms 15 to 17. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these friends, this time, and your word. As we gather around it together, let us hear your spirit speak to us to identify its truth and to live accordingly. It is a good day to be together in you, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I said, page 8, Psalm 15. And as I read verse 1 to you, uh, what I'm looking for here is how you feel about it, your first impression. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? When you hear those questions, is your first thought, Ooh, I don't know, not me. Uh, who is worthy to worship? Who would God invite? Who would God allow into his sanctuary? And if this were the only verse that you uh, read on this subject, would you think, oh, this is troubling. Or instead, would you recognize that God wants worshipers and that he's not going to exclude everyone, but instead he's going to include those who are his? So David poses this question in Psalm 15 and verse 1. and um, This is an example, I would say, of the wonderful variety that we find in the Psalms. Um, it is... Uh, uh, kind of philosophical on one point, or theological, but on the other point, very devotional as well. Like Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6, Psalm 15 is what's called an entrance psalm. It was a song that was sung in coming to the temple and, excuse me, in uh, ascending the hill to worship God in his temple. So, in the Old Testament times, God could only be encountered in designated spaces with limited access. Uh, for example, the Holy of Holies um, was a place that only the high priest could visit and then only once a year. The holy place was open to priests only, and then the outer court was open to men only. So there was uh, a sense of, of God being... Uh, distant yet accessible in the proper place and by the proper people. Um, the New Living Translation uh, translates this psalm differently. Uh, uh, other versions will use the word dwell and live, but even so, those, verses, uh, those words in the original language imply a temporary residence. The reference to a holy hill is, of course, Mount Zion, where the temple was situated. And sinners come to God's sanctuary to receive forgiveness, but righteous people come to worship him. So David sets out to answer those two questions in the remaining verses of Psalm 15. This is letter B on the top of your page 8. First of all, those who are able to come are those who lead blameless lives. Let's read it. Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. So here we have several things. Blameless lives. And by the word, way, that word blameless is the one that was used of Noah back in the book of Genesis, that he was the one person on the earth who was found to be blameless. We know that in Noah's case, that did not mean perfect. 
but it did mean that his life was on a moral trajectory and following God's way. So blameless, David defines for us here in verse 2 as doing what is right. He also says those who speak the truth from sincere hearts. And you would think, um, well, isn't that kind of two ways of saying the same thing? But no, not really. Um, it's possible for people to speak the truth insincerely. They're just telling you the facts. Uh, so this is the highest standard doing both. Then in verse 3, those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. So this is ex expressed negatively. People who avoid gossip and avoid doing evil or have any harmful speech. And then in verse 4, those who despise flagrant sinners and honor faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. So those who despise flagrant sinners, I think that's an amusing uh, way of putting it. Um, it. It doesn't mean that you can sin uh, secretly or quietly and get away with it, but what instead it's saying is uh, avoid the social taint of being associated with people who uh, are very bold about their sinning and don't care what God thinks, don't care what other people think. They're just intent on doing what they want to do. Um, and then uh, honor faithful followers. So they avoid evil people and honor good people. Verse 5, those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Here are some more characteristics of people who can come to God's house and worship. The, those who show that they are not greedy by lending money without charging interest and refuse bribes to commit injustice. The law that God gave to Moses forbid the practice of usury. That is something that we would probably refer to as loan sharking. Uh, people who lend money but do it at such an exorbitant rate of interest because their purpose in lending is not uh, benevolent. It's to make money. And while there's nothing inherently evil about making money, uh, it is wrong to take advantage of the poor and needy by overcharging them interest. Um, so what we're seeing here is, uh, I would say, the word integrity expressed in five different ways. In verse 2, integrity of speech. Verse 3, uh, avoiding sins of the tongue, showing integrity that way. Uh, third, integrity of relations. Uh, verse 4, uh, and then also in verse 4, integrity of oaths. And in verse 5, integrity of money. So people who show integrity, not, not just, and not just show it, but also have it in their hearts, um, those are the people who are welcomed into God's court. Now, let us see what promise is made to people whose conduct shows they are worthy to worship the Lord. Well, that's at the, the very end of verse 5. Uh, Such people, David wrote, will stand firm forever. Stand firm. That means their lives will not be thrown into turmoil, term, turmoil that they will not uh, have to experience the chaos that is typical to evildoers and really injustice is what they deserve. And I think um, the fact that David was led here to use the word forever 
is not a hyperbole, it's not poetic license, it's David making a statement about the afterlife, and we're going to see that again uh, later on, that uh, uh, I believe David did believe in life after death, and he refers to it here in the Psalms, and says that it's a point of worship and praise to the Lord. So, <clears throat> that's Psalm six, uh, 15. We're going to take a moment now, and if I can get this cheaply made thing to flip for me. We're going to go on to Psalm 16. Let me just step out of frame for a second here. Get a little extra light on the subject and a little less noise. There we go. And on to Psalm 16. Also on your page 8 of the handouts. All right. Psalm 16. What is David's plea to the Lord in verse 1? Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. His plea is twofold. It's for safety and for refuge. Acknowledging God is the source of every good thing in verse 2. So, safety and refuge are two very good things, particularly when you are feeling oppressed, set upon, that people uh, are legitimately out to get you for whatever reasons. And God gives David perfect security. He doesn't list any specific troubles here, um, but seeks the Lord. Now that's often the way in Psalms that a lament begins. And a lament, remember, is one thing that we're looking for in each of these Psalms. Um, but uh, it turns into what uh, one interpreter called an, a confidence psalm. So it's more worshipful because he expresses confidence in the Lord. So, this is David's plea in verse 1, safety, refuge. And he says in verses 2 to 4 that safety and refuge are found for the faithful who trust in the Lord. Let's see what he says about the faithful. Verse 2, I said to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. May, may we affirm the same truth in our worship of the Lord. So David says here in verse 2 that faithful people submit to the Lord as their master, recognizing he is the source of every good thing. We often think of the things that come into our life as being a product of our, our intelligence or hard work or, or random circumstances that we could call luck. But uh, David has no such uh, mistakes in his thinking. He knows that they have been gifted to him by the Lord. He praises the Lord for his special relationship. And that word master is on an emotional level, kind of an inadequate translation of the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is most excellent Lord, Lord of all. Or we might say, as the New Testament affirms about Jesus, that he is Lord of Lords. And it emphasizes his complete authority. And he exercises his authority to provide good things for his people. Not exclusively, and the definition of good uh, is going to be a little different sometimes between us and God, but we understand that all things work for good, as Paul wrote to the Romans. Verse 3, the godly people in the land are my true heroes. I take pleasure in them. So David celebrated godly people as true heroes and as a source of pleasure to good people. And Jesus affirmed in his teaching that good things come out of a good heart, and bad things out of a bad heart. 
And so the the way we look at things in life and the, the attitude that we have, the perspective that we have, is really a reflection of our inner self and the decisions that we have made about life. The things we believe at our core. Verse 4 gives us one more insight into uh, trusting in the Lord. And it says, Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. So, we've learned a couple things about godly people. Now we're looking and saying, on the other hand, um, idolaters can expect troubles. And so, uh, one of the things that godly people do is just avoid all of that and not get involved with them in their idolatry. All right. And then... What answer did the Lord give to David? And these are some beautiful verses. When, when the commentator calls this a confidence psalm, um, it, it, it re, he really means it. He's expressing some confidence in the Lord. So, verse 5. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The Lord had provided David an inheritance, guarding all his possessions. God is David's sole loyalty, which legitimizes his inheritance. And this uh, word inheritance is often used in reference to the promised land, uh, but certainly is not restricted to that. And um, all that is mine is uh, a reference to the land and uh, the possession of it, which was assigned by God. If you remember back to uh, your book of Judges in the Old Testament, how did they decide who got what piece of land? And they did it by drawing lots, a, a random method, and yet uh, they believed that God revealed his will in the result of that apparently random method. So it would be a little bit like uh, taking a pair of dice and, and making decisions based on the roll. Oh, that's a seven. Pretty common. Um, and then he refers specifically to the land in verse 6. You have given me a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. And uh, today uh, the weather is uh, 60 degrees and sunny. And it's a really a lovely day for November, especially. I don't know that it would technically be called Indian summer, but maybe. Anyway, it's a pleasant land. On days like today, it's very easy to feel that way. Um, so David's delight is in the Lord primarily, but the benefits of his faith are also uh, something that pleases David. Let's look at verse 7. Another answer God has given. David writes, I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night my heart instructs me. So, uh, because the Lord was a constant pre... Oh, excuse me. This is number 3 under letter C. The Lord had guided or instructed David. Well, actually done both. And the reference at, in the Psalms at night, um, it's uh, stated in Scripture from time to time that night is the uh, time when evil tends to come out and do its thing. And so um, if, you, if you do something godly at night, then that is especially meaningful. Um, Okay, and he had uh, guided his heart, his inmost being, um, which is, I think, a, an advanced concept in the Old Testament as well. Okay, number four, and this is um, verse eight. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right 
beside me. And uh, we, we've already heard him talk about a firm, uh, being firm forever. Here he is not shaken by adversity. And that word means just what you think it does. It means to, to shake with fear. It means to have one's worldview come into question, have one's faith uh, beset by doubts. Um, it's an experience that the faithful avoid by trusting in God. Okay, number five, uh, the fifth thing that God uh, has done for David in answer to his plea is uh, in the next verse, verse 9, No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. Or as we have learned it familiarly in the King James, My heart therefore is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. Often use that at uh, committal services or at funerals. The Lord lifted David's spirits, making his heart glad, causing him to rejoice, and allowing him to rest in safety. And that kind of runs the gamut of emotions, doesn't it? Um, that uh, he's glad, he's rejoicing, and yet uh, later on he can rest in safety. And then uh, verses 10 and 11. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Um, this verse was used as a prophecy of, of Jesus and his resurrection. Um, you will show me the path of life, granting me the joy of your presence and pleasures of living with you forevermore. So David's optimism extended to the afterlife, as promised, uh, here in verses 10 and 11. But what did David believe about life after death? Well, what does he tell us? He says, God is not going to abandon me, just the opposite. He's going to show me the path of life. And in his presence, I will know eternal joy and pleasures. This is a great fit for our previous study about heaven, isn't it? That uh, David was confident that God had an eternal home for him, that it would not be the abode of the dead called Sheol, uh, but instead it would be a place in God's presence. Time in his company, the pleasure of his company. Now turn over your page to page 9, and let's reflect on Psalm 16 for a moment. What reasons can you find in this psalm to praise the Lord? I would think there would be a great number of psalms um, that uh, we could, uh, or excuse me, things in this psalm that we can praise the Lord for. My answer was eternal life. God gives me life in this world and eternal life in the next. Number two, what should I why should I cry out to the Lord? And I go back to verse 1, where David cried out for safety and refuge. And we feel that way from time to time, whether we're being opposed by persons or by circumstance or some combination. Uh, we, we ask God to uh, give us safety and refuge. And then third, what truths should I affirm? What instruction can I find from my knowledge of God and his creation. And I think this verse, or this psalm, affirms God's care of his people. That we can trust in his care. All right, that's Psalm 16. Now let's take a moment here and get set up for Psalm 17. A little paper to shuffle here. All right. David, um, in Psalm 17, is making a prayer. And this psalm, unlike some others, uh, more than others, is 
directed at God, to God. And so we know it's a prayer to him. And in this prayer, David, first of all, sets forth his qualifications for answered prayer for justice. And we see that in the first five verses and then also in verse 15. So let's explore those, starting with verse 1. O Lord, hear my plea for justice. Listen to my cry for help. And we observed earlier in... Uh, in Psalm 16, that this sounds like a lament. It begins sort of as a lament. Well, very similar here, first part of verse 1. Pay attention to my prayer, for it comes from honest lips. And so, one of the things that, that David says leads to uh, God answering prayers, and, and, and hopefully with a yes, is honesty that our prayers are honest. And really, when you think about it, what's the point of, of posturing or trying to impress God? He knows us fully, thoroughly, and is not impressed by our words uh, or, or deeds unless they come from a sincere heart. Verse 2, Declare me innocent, for you see those who... Who do right. Now that word innocent is going to figure pretty prominently in this psalm. Uh, so the Lord who has examined David and all the way to the core of his being, every thought, every conviction, every action, every attitude is exposed to God. He knows our hearts and David says because he knows, he knows that the truth is that he is innocent. Verse 3, You have tested my thoughts and examined my heart in the night. Okay, again, in the night, that time when evil comes to the fore. You have scrutinized me and found nothing wrong. How could that be true? Well, remember when God forgives our sins, he forgets them. And so it is actually true that God sees nothing wrong with us. I am determined not to sin in what I say. May the same be said of us. I have followed your commands, which keep me from following cruel and evil people. My steps have stayed on your path. I have not wavered from following you. So what is it David observing here in verses 2 to 5? He's observing that the Lord who knows him will surely find him innocent, finding nothing wrong in the way that he has followed the Lord's commands. David was unwavering in his faithfulness to God. And as we observed earlier with the term blameless, this does not imply a kind of perfection that we achieve on our own. It's not a matter of a willpower or won't power. It's a matter of God's power and his willingness to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right, now let's skip down to verse 15. And we'll see uh, the last of these qualifications that David sets forth. He writes in the last verse of Psalm 17, Because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. So here David says, uh, this is uh, A3 on your paper, middle of page 9, David counted upon seeing God because he was righteous. And let's just take a moment to hone in on exactly what David says here. Because I am righteous, I will see you. So that's a depth of relationship that is not possible in this life. God frequently says, in the Old Testament in particular, that to see his face is to die, because 
God is too holy to be seen. And the only exceptions to that are the ones that God grants. Uh, so this is a, the highest measure of intimacy with God, to be face to face with him. But notice what he says, when I wake, awake, then, David says, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. In the Old Testament, sleeping is often a euphemism for death. And so, if you believe, as I do, in the uh, state of unconsciousness prior between death and resurrection, uh, the transitional state, um, this verse affirms that. If you don't believe it, then you have a hard time explaining this verse, except maybe to say his reference uh, to the night in verse 3 now becomes consummated in verse 15 in his wakeful state. But I don't think it carries quite the same punch and power if you uh, rationalize it in that way. Opinions vary. Feel free to disagree. So we've seen how David sets forth the qualifications for answered prayer. Now letter B, David sets forth the conditions to answered prayer. Qualifications, now conditions. And this is in verses 6 through 11. He writes, I am praying to you because I know you will answer, O God. Bend down and listen as I pray. David is fully convinced that God answers his prayers, that he he not only hears them, but answers them. And yet, he feels it's necessary to um, petition God, please bend down and listen to me as I pray. So, the faith is there, but the plea accompanies the faith. The plea is not the same as doubt. It's merely an emotional appeal from David to God. Verse 7. Show me your unfailing love in wonderful ways. By your mighty power, you rescue those who seek refuge from their enemies. That phrase, unfailing love, is going to occur very often in the Psalms. And it refers to the covenant love that God has for us as his people and that we have for God as our Lord and Master. By his mighty power, the Lord will rescue David and give him refuge, there's that word again, from his enemies, there in verse 7. Now, uh, number 3, as we look at verse 8, the conditions of answered prayer, protect me from wicked people who attack me, from murderous enemies who surround me. The Lord will guard David as a person instinctively guards his own eyes. That's in reference to verse 8. Um, so, verse 7, this is number 2 on your handout. The Lord will show David his unfailing love by his mighty power. The Lord will rescue him and give him refuge. And then number 3, the Lord will guard David As a, um, as a person instinctively defends their own eyes. And, and that's um, a, a great example, isn't it? Because we've all done that before. Uh, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And there's another very typical example or illustration from nature. A mother bird uh, shel sheltering and protecting her eggs and her chicks as uh, they grow. Um, so the Lord will provide complete safety in the shadow of his wings. Uh, verse 9, protect me from wicked people who attack me, from murderous enemies who surround me. And this gets to sound kind of repetitive, I know, uh, but uh, the Lord, uh, one of the things that David says that, that the Lord will do when he answers his prayer is protect him from wicked and murderous people. He says of them in verse 10, they are without pity, listen to their boasting. 
they, uh, okay, listen to their boasting. They are proud and pitiless. Uh, proud like a lion. Why do I say that? Well, look at verse 2, uh, not 2, 12. 11 and 12. They track me down and surround me, waiting, watching for the chance to throw me to the ground. They are like hungry lions, eager to tear me apart, like young lions hiding in ambush. So they stalk David. They are waiting to ambush him in verses 11 and 12. The sixth condition for answered prayer is in verse 13. Arise, O God, O Lord. Stand against them and bring them to their knees. Rescue me from the wicked with your sword. And remember, whenever we see in the Psalms that plea, Arise, O Lord, that's a clue to us that David is invoking the divine warrior. He's calling on God to put on his armor and take up his weapons in defense of David. And that image of God as a divine warrior is something that we have studied in Isaiah. We see it also in Revelation, particularly chapter 19, when Jesus rides out and, and slays the armies of the enemies of his people. Um, so this is not an image that we should shy away from. I think there are some in the church that Jesus meek and mild is all they want to hear about and talk about. And that is simply uh, only part of who Jesus is, who God is. So part of the Lord's rescue will be the defeat of the wicked. And then in verse 14, By the power of your hand, O Lord, destroy those who look to this world for their reward, but satisfy the hunger of your treasured ones. May their children have plenty, leaving an inheritance for their descendants. So God's powerful hand, literally his right hand, will be demonstrated in two things. The first, in verse 14, is the destruction of heavenly mind, or excuse me, worldly minded people. The destruction of worldly minded people. The second is the satisfaction of heavenly minded people. And uh, again, Friends, we don't want to shy away from these um, justice and holiness elements of who God is. It's true that God is love, but love is not a sappy sentiment. It's not uh, a toothless uh, kind of a response that says, Oh well, in the face of evil, I wish they wouldn't do that. Uh, this is an active rebuking, punishing disciplining, and ultimately, without repentance, wrathful reaction by God. So David has set forth in Psalm 17 his qualifications for answered prayer and his conditions for answered prayer. These are the things that David requested of the Lord. So why should I praise the Lord? What answer do you give there? at the bottom of page 9. When you read Psalm 17, now that we've studied it together, what reason do you have to praise the Lord, to worship Him? And then, why should you cry out to the Lord? Do you feel like you have enemies in this life? Do you feel like circumstances or uh, illness or injury are an enemy to you? And then finally, what truths should I affirm? What instruction do you receive from this psalm that you want to add to your understanding of God and his creation? Next time, we're going to tackle uh, just a single psalm, Psalm 18. And uh, that may seem like um, we're um, doing these in unequal parts, but... Actually, as I said at the beginning, we're trying to average about 50 verses a week, and Psalm 18 is just a particularly long psalm. So we'll be spending 
the entirety of our time uh, next time in Psalm 18. So I hope you have an opportunity to uh, read through that, study it, pray over it. If you haven't yet received the next set of lessons, please contact us at the office at uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church, and we'll be happy to get those to you as soon as possible. Until then, God keep you.